Welcome to this webinar. Today, we are going to discuss about energy transition and climate change, from bold ideas to saving the world. I am Matina Michobonu from Energy Spin, and I'm going to be the moderator of this discussion. I would also like to welcome and thank our excellent guests who are going to tackle this serious issue. Starting with Peter Westerbacher, a visionary with global ambitions and the mentality of getting impossible things done. Peter, welcome. Hey, Would you like you. to say a few things about yourself? Yeah, I think that already captures quite a bit. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to get uh, things done. Always enjoy doing things. Always been an entrepreneur. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, entrepreneurs are people who do things. And, and, uh, and I think that that's something that we uh, really need. I mean, looking at now the current like pandemic and of course, uh, all the other like uh, little crises that we have here and there. Uh, so I think that uh, entrepreneurship to the rescue and, and uh, I think that it's very important that we are very ambitious in uh, uh, what we do and, and uh, that also applies to when we look at, you know, like the climate change and, and uh, some of the big, big challenges that we have out there that, uh, again, uh, I always uh, like to say that there are very few things that uh, actually are uh, impossible. So uh, as long as we don't have to break any, you know, like uh, laws of nature or anything like that, then typically there is always a way uh, to get uh, things done. And uh, I think that's something that uh, is, is very important. And uh, yeah, it's really great to be, you know, uh, uh, here uh, with you, so uh, like uh, online today. And, and uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see what we can come up with together. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Greatly said. Thank you very much. We continue with Marco Kuokanen, who is responsible for technology and business at Energy Spin and has vast experience in several positions in Energy Tech. Marco, would you also say a few things about yourself, please? Yeah, thank you, Martina. Yeah, this energy story is a quite interesting one because uh, I've been doing this energy business for more than 20 years. And, and uh, on those days when I started, uh, nobody spoke about the climate change and, 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 uh, and really the hot topics which are nowadays all the time spoken and and, uh, and actually this is now very interesting phase because we have lots of technologies what you can actually use uh, and combine by let's say digital tools and and, and uh, now everyone is talking about let's say electrical vehicles and uh, batteries and and and, uh, and how to really to reduce the let's say that the co2 emissions so so this is like a mixture and and uh, and uh, but peter i think uh, you could also, let's say, say some words that, uh, what do you think about this whole thing? Because it's a lots of things ongoing and and, uh, and we don't have the crystal ball that how, how the future looks like. So, so what do you think about the current development? Yeah, so I, I think that, uh, uh, again, as I said, uh, there are very few things out there that actually are like uh, impossible. And, and I think also one thing, uh, uh, you know, that is kind of like, uh, of course, true about the future that, uh, you know, we can't really predict it. But then there's also, you know, like the very good saying that, you know, the best uh, way to predict the future is to actually like make it happen. And, uh, you know, that's a nice thing that we can actually have an impact and we can do things. So, uh, you know, of course, all of our uh, uh, actions uh, matter. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, also uh, there is a lot going on. The world is changing, you know, uh, uh, faster kind of like all the time so uh, again uh, uh, my kind of like approach has always been then to kind of like uh, start doing things uh, about like all of that and of course we can't do uh, everything but we can do anything I think that's also like an uh, kind of like a important kind of like a, a thing to always uh, keep in mind uh, that uh, you know it, it's and you know uh, all of these uh, these big challenges, uh, you know, typically they will require that we work uh, on them together. So uh, it's it's not like about uh, like one person, one team, but it's actually like many people, many teams, many companies. And and I think that it's, this is also if I look at kind of like what you guys are doing now in Vasa and with Energy Spin and all of that, I think it's very important that we are bringing people and companies together to tackle uh, the big uh, problems. And I think that this is something that. I mean, uh, being here now in, in Finland, I mean, there's very few of us, if you look at the big kind of like global picture, and always when we've had big problems, big challenges, uh, we have uh, tackled those by working uh, together. And I think that uh, that is also one reason why, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, like on the 
IT and uh, like technology side that Finland is like a superpower when it comes to open source. So, you know, creating things together and then sharing those things, those innovations, those solutions with the rest of the world and many times actually contributing them uh, for free. And uh, of course, then, uh, you know, with open source, then there are other business models. But I think that we can learn a lot from these kind of approaches also when we think about, uh, you know, big challenges now like, uh, you know, the climate change. So I, I think that uh, for me, it's about doing things and it's about doing things together. Mm -hmm. I actually like your co comment regarding starting to do things, because usually when you start to do things, you start to, let's say, see something what you have not understood before, and that is that will lead to the new innovation. So personally, I think that is really important. You really start to do something, because then then your picture will start to change. Yes, I, 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 I think that that is <coughs> very, very important point. And, and, uh, and that is actually another thing that I'm a big believer in learning by doing. So this is also, you know, like uh, uh, we can create the perfect plan, you know, sitting, you know, at our offices or at home uh, like now and then create, you know, like that. And then the world has already moved on, you know, and it's not a perfect plan anymore if it ever was. And I think that uh, uh, I, I totally agree with this, that, you know, like when you start doing, you learn and you discover new things that you hadn't thought about. And, and it's the same thing that when you start talking about your ideas, your thoughts with other people, they will make those uh, thoughts and those ideas better. So again, it's, it's uh, why it's so important to actually just like start doing, of course, not like just, you know, re recklessly running around, but you also, of course, have to have a bit of a plan and, and you have to think about what you are doing. But what I always say there is that, that we are not in a rush but we want to move very fast. And I think that this is something that is always, you know, like uh, misunderstood, you know, like in this, that, oh, that you have to be, you know, like busy and you have to run like very fast. Yes, we want to move fast, but we are not in a rush, meaning that it's also good to kind of like uh, stop and think, you know, now and then, but uh, just thinking doesn't get us anywhere. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's great. And at this point, I would like to introduce another doer in our company, which is Marco Koski and he is the founder of Energy Spain. Would you like Marco to say a few things about yourself and also jump into the conversation and give us your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've been working with the, uh, business angels and startups since 10 years. Uh, it's excellent to have a, a Peter talking with Peter Westerbach on how to pick, make big things that done. And uh, so this is something very important stuff what is going on with the energy transition. Uh, there's a lot of things happening in the world, and uh, I, I wouldn't say too much about myself because there are more important stuff to discuss about now. Uh, energy crisis is coming, and they, we, we have all the solutions which we could actually now in our hands to make this everything happen and make the world a better place. So basically, I would like to see that uh, how perhaps better could, in your position, in your because you've been working a little bit different stuff as well, so in energy sector, what would be your kind of moves, how to make the ro rolling in, in, in the towards better world? Yeah, so uh, uh, I, I think that uh, the way I look at it is uh, obviously not an expert in, uh, in uh, you know, the energy uh, sector or, or anything like that. But uh, I would also say that I'm not like an expert of, kind of like that many things, you know, like period. But I think that uh, there is some uh, commonality, you know, no matter what you're working on. And I already kind of like touched a little bit about the, on that, that it's not about uh, kind of like uh, one person or one company. I mean, it typically requires kind of like the whole ecosystem, if you if you will. So uh, all the different players, you know, the, the people, the companies, the, you know, research institutions, the universities, uh, the cities, uh, the nations, you know. So it's, it's uh, uh, something that, uh, again, it's really important then to bring uh, all the key uh, kind of stakeholders, the key, uh, you know, uh, doers and movers, you know, uh, together uh, to actually kind of like then uh, figure out what we need to do. And I think that like the energy side is like no different that then, you know, we have lots of uh, uh, cool new technologies, new approaches. But again, if we don't put them into use, uh, who cares? And I think that there we need to really think about then uh, how can we accelerate the deployment of some of these things and how can we move to where we kind of like know where we uh, uh, need to go and have to go 
uh, like in, in energy. So, uh, of course, you know, uh, it's all about getting rid of the fossil fossil fuels and then like the uh, moving to renewable and, and uh, like that's like on a high level, I think, uh, no matter if you're an expert or not or not in that uh, like something that everybody realizes that we need to do and then again it's about the doing that how do we get there where do we start and and uh, and i think that uh, one very important thing is to get the right people together and then uh, start looking at that okay uh, what uh, can we do with all of these uh, amazing new technologies that we have so it, it's kind of like the doers and the experts and and like all of these uh, uh different uh different kind of like people or different companies with different skills different competencies need to come together and and i think that uh, you know looking at like with uh, energy spin and what you guys are doing i mean we need to do those kind of things uh all the time and and then really think about uh, uh what we can do locally but of course then uh, replicating that and, and come up with like global solutions. So, so uh, that's, that's again, like in startup world always, uh, how do we scale like whatever we came up with? And that's also like a different uh, skill uh, that uh, is needed in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree on that one. Things that you can, you can be a catalyst, you can be a founder, start of something. But you need all the other aspects uh, involved as well. You need all the partners, all the participants to be to make the movement going. And that's I, I agree with your point definitely that it's something you start with the smaller smaller ones and then you start replicating, scaling it up because the solutions they are global, especially with the energy sector. Of course, you have to take all the let's say local local ingredients to be involved. But that's something get the ball run, rolling rolling so. That's one of the things I've seen you doing, and uh, that's one of the things we need to do. Also, cooperate very much on on different issues. But if we expand from that perspective, so uh, you're doing a big stuff, and but how actually get those others involved? I, that's your kind of a main main thesis. But how are you able to get the other parties involved to making things happen? Yeah, I think that that's uh, also it comes to kind of like. Uh how you look at uh, leadership and, and I think that is also part of uh, like making things happen and uh, maybe kind of like the most important thing there I mean okay uh, we can't uh, predict the future as we already uh, touched on but uh, we can of course impact it and we can kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like uh, make the kind of future happen that uh, we want to happen so so I think that then uh, we need to kind of like agree on like where do we want to go and and uh, you know define some uh, some uh, fairly like clear uh, goals and and uh, then uh, uh, start thinking about okay how do we actually get there and again it doesn't have to be uh, kind of like uh, you know a perfect plan a perfect roadmap or anything like that I mean things will change uh, as they you know always do uh, on our on our like journey uh, towards that goal but I think that it's very cl- uh, very important that we define. Uh, a very easy, very clear, very understandable goal that this is where we want to go uh, together. And then we basically start looking at that, okay, what do we need to do today, next week, you know, next year? Uh, what are the steps? How do we actually get there? So uh, so it's like uh, the long term, uh, you know, the very ambitious goal, ideally. And then uh, what do we need to do, you know, like right now uh, to start uh, kind of like moving in that direction? And, and uh uh, it's important that then everybody in the organization, everybody in the ecosystem uh, depends on like how we, we kind of define the oral environment, that everybody knows where we want to go. And I think that if we look at many organizations uh, and, you know, the bigger the organization typically, then it's uh, uh, even more challenging, but you will get many different answers when you ask the people there that, okay, what are you actually doing here in your organization and where are you going? And, and I think that if you don't have a kind of like a common shared understanding of uh, what you're actually up to in your company, in your organization, then, uh, you know, it's a little bit like uh, saying that, okay, that if you don't know where you want to go, you're not going to get there. But I mean, it's, it's very, very true. And that's kind of like, again, where strategy and leadership and, you know, all of these uh, things come into play. Actually, I have a comment related on your comment because uh, just recently yesterday we had a 
discussion with one of the corporates and, and uh, this corporate leader said that one of the reasons that they want to cooperate with startups is that uh, they have a very heavy processes, but they want to understand and learn how startups are doing things. That just to make the mixture of these two things that uh, to, to have to get be best out of it. So. Yeah, I would definitely say that you, we need the corporates being part of that because they have all the outreach, they have all the connections, and startups don't have that one. But uh, they have the bold, uh, bold missions and uh, ambitions. So combining those two is the way the way to go forward and having having the things going on. At this point, I would like to thank very much Marco Kuokanen for his participation in the discussion and sharing his ideas. Yeah, thank you. And welcome another great speaker, Tia Maria Kinula. Tia Maria is HR coordinator at Vartila, and she also holds the position of chairwoman in Vasa Entrepreneurship Society. Welcome, Tia Maria. <laughs> I would also ask you to share a few things about yourself before starting into the and jumping into the conversation. Okay. Hi. Uh, great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, like you said, uh, I am the newest chairwoman and the chairperson of VES, the VAS Entrepreneurship Society. And uh, actually, I was just officially selected this Tuesday, so this is quite recent. So I'm happy to hear, be here and discuss these topics. I think that even though startups and energy uh, they are my daily tasks in my profession, but they are areas of personal interest and, of course, familiar through best operations. So I look forward to discussing these topics with you. Yeah, I think P Peter has been working quite a lot with the uh, entrepreneurial societies in uh, other other cities as well, and also in Vasa originally, if, uh, if I'm correct. And uh, well, can you say a few words about working with these interesting students? Yeah, I mean, uh... We have a very vibrant uh, uh, like ecosystem uh, of uh, entrepreneurship societies at all our universities in, in Finland. So I think that is something that is a key uh, uh, element in, in uh, how we built uh, the whole you know, very, very dynamic and vibrant uh, startup community uh, in Finland and in, in kind of like our part of the world. So uh, you know, I always look at this like whole finest Bay Area that I have there in, in the background. So everything around this little body of water that we are we're kind of like, uh, uh, around here. So, so uh, I think that uh, it's very important that uh, uh, we have the entrepreneurship societies at the universities and in like in the cities because uh, it's, it's a great uh, way to meet with like-minded people. And, and this is actually uh, something that we set out to do when we started Slush in 2008. I mean, of course, now everybody knows Slush as like the biggest and best startup event on the planet, but actually we started Slush not to create like a fantastic event, which it also became, but it was actually all about uh, changing the mindset, changing the attitude so that we get more people into entrepreneurship and, you know, interested in starting companies and, and uh, you know, making things happen, doing things. And I think that the entrepreneurship societies are uh, super important uh, for that because uh, then, uh, you know, you will meet with like-minded people. So you'll see that there are other crazy people that are thinking about, oh, hey, why not do a startup and, and you know, not go and work for, you know, uh, uh, big companies or, or something like that. So there's an alternative. I mean, it used to be that the only like career path was that, okay, uh, you know, once I graduate, I'll go and work for one of the big guys and, you know, like that's it. And that was why we had to start Slush. But I think that with the entrepreneurship side, is, it's, it's uh, great to see, you know, then uh, uh, other people that are thinking about, uh, you know, similar things. And, and uh, that's always, uh, you know, it's important to have kind of like the peer uh, support. And uh, also, uh, uh, it's a great uh, platform for, uh, you know, sharing your ideas and then uh, making your ideas uh, better. So uh, I, I'm a huge fan of that and a huge fan of getting, uh, you know, uh, uh, the young people uh, involved because, uh, of course, uh, young people are the future. And I think that uh, uh, the more uh, uh, support and the more uh, these kind of like platforms and uh, environments that we can create where people can come together, uh, I think uh, the more the better. And uh, yeah, I have some friends that have been in the Vasa Entrepreneurship Society, uh, you know, before. So I'm a little bit familiar with uh, some of the activities uh, kind of like over, over there. So I uh, even had some 
some of the boss entrepreneurship uh, this uh, people join for some trips to like uh, India and Vietnam and uh, uh, all of that. So uh, I know that there's like a lot of very cool international and global activity from boss as well. So it's cool. Just uh, one thought about that when you thought about Slash as well. So Mika Huttunen, by the way, was a founder of VES, uh, CEO for Slash at the moment. So it's, it's, there, there are connections there and from the bold ideas to bigger things. So definitely there's something what is going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from the bold ideas to making it happen. So VES is definitely something. But as your, as your old Tia Maria, so... Could you, what do, what do you think about this bold ideas making the big one? And because you're working also on the big corporate, so at the same time, of course, you have entitled to, but how, how you see the cooperation between the startups and how to make, make the bold ideas, the big, big things happening. So what, what do you, what's your take on that one? And that the transition of, let's say, big, big climate crisis, which is in, uh, in our footsteps already on doorstep. So. What's your take on that one? And if you have any questions to Peter on, on that issue as well. Uh, well, I think that the main point that I have there is that it's definitely to, to bring these big ideas to life. It's definitely an ecosystem game. So you, you're not doing it alone. And that's definitely something that I think this also is a big part of, that we can be a part of different projects and we want to facilitate these things. Uh, but also in a more general level that when we have big companies, um, they are more and more also collaborating with startups and smaller companies because we do understand that we cannot make it alone in this world anymore. And it's not anymore about who is the bigger fish in the, sh in the sea. It's more about uh, which fish is the fastest. And if we are alone and we are moving towards a future we are not certain of, as a huge company, it's not probably as easy as it is for the agile smaller companies. So combining those uh, to work together, I think that's the very well a key factor. And I do think that many companies are already seeing this today. But what do you think, uh, Peter? Do you agree with this point? Or, or is there something else that maybe we should consider at least in the VASA area or, or through VES perhaps? Yeah. No, I, I think that uh, it's definitely about, uh, you know, looking at the whole ecosystem. And, and then, uh, uh, of course, uh, part of that is looking at like the strengths like locally. And I mean, okay, now we're looking at like the power uh, side of things. And, and I think that that's, of course, what Vasa is known for. And I think then uh, it's uh, taking that local uh, uh, expertise and, and then looking at how you can apply it uh, globally and how you can work with other ecosystems kind of like all over the planet. So uh, I think that that's, uh, again, uh, one area where, uh, uh, you know, best could do uh, and we can all always do like more. So uh, I think that that's, uh, that's kind of like safe to say. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, I always encourage uh, all the different uh, ESEs, you know, that we have around Finland that we should always think about, uh, you know, uh, the world uh, out there. And, and uh, it's not just like the local ecosystem. But, uh, and I think that that's something that is already happening to, to uh, you know, large extent. So uh, I, I'm just looking at like then doing even more of that. And, and uh, then I think that uh, it's also important to engage uh, more people locally. So uh, you have the, all the different uh, universities, different schools uh, in, uh, in Vasa. And uh, I mean, I know that there's good collaboration already. And, and what is nice about West that, of course, you're covering like all of those. Uh, and it's not like uh, one uh, specific kind of like university that, uh, that you're covering. So I think that's already like a very, very good uh, approach. So I would just encourage you then kind of like look maybe even, even kind of like uh, broader. I know that, you know, for example, Seinejoki is very far away, but, you know, maybe there's some collaboration you could do there. And, uh, you know, like there's always uh, those kind of things that, uh, you know, and then looking at, uh, okay, what can we do together uh, uh, for the world? So I think that that's, uh, you know, how I, I would look at it. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. And uh, I also agree with the fact that it's good that our organization is really uh, welcoming to all the different universities and universities of applied sciences in the region uh, instead yeah. of just focusing on one area. And I think we already actually have some collaboration with other ES societies throughout Finland at least. And um, I think there are quite good communities online where we can join and kind of collaborate with them. I think that definitely during the COVID crisis especially, the world has become a bit smaller in that sense that the ecosystem is a wider 
wider uh, concept now because all of us are mostly working from home and not maybe doing things face to face. So it doesn't really matter if you're in Helsinki or if you're if you're in Germany or if you're in another country or whatever your location is, you can be in the same community and work together. Yeah, totally. And, and actually one great example that we've started like during the pandemic is uh, Ambitious Africa. And that is uh, kind of like bringing all different ESEs uh, together, uh, not only in Finland, but in like uh, all of the Nordic countries. So we have a bunch of people now from Sweden, from Denmark, from Norway uh, on board, actually the rest of Europe as well. Uh, so uh, kind of like local young people uh, from the different ESEs working together with then uh, uh, their counterparts uh, in uh, Africa. So we now have 25 uh, African uh, countries on board where we have local teams that typically then consist of, you know, two uh, uh, people from um, uh, local ES here in, in Finland and Nordic countries working together with uh, kind of like local young people. Then, you know, like in Kenya, in uh, Rwanda, in Zimbabwe, in Namibia, you know, like uh, uh, 25 of the 54 African uh, nations. And we're starting actually this year will be in all 54. Uh, so that is uh, kind of like a, a very interesting uh, collaboration and we've been able to move very, very fast because of the pandemic that everything is online and uh, things are now like uh, much smaller. I mean, just like, you know, I'm not in Vasa obviously now, I'm here in Espo in Finland, uh, but uh, again, I could be, you know, like in, in Africa, I could be, you know, like, uh, I don't know, in Harare or <laughs> someplace like that and it wouldn't like be much, uh, much different. And I think that this is a great example, again, bringing all the different ESEs together. But uh, another interesting thing, and of course, there is like a Vasa angle to this, that uh, Wärtsilä is one of the first like corporate partners for Ambitious Africa. And then, uh, you know, the answer to why is pretty obvious, because uh, for, from Wärtsilä perspective, uh, all the biggest kind of like power plant and, you know, the biggest projects are actually on the African continent. It's the fastest growing, uh, you know, seven, I think seven or eight of the fastest growing economies on the planet are actually in Africa. And also, if you look at like where uh, there is like the biggest need of power, of course, economic growth need, drives that and actually also the power generation and availability drives economic growth. So it's like a circular thing there. But I, I think that... Uh, also, uh, you know, why I wanted to bring this up is that Wärtsilä has been in Africa since 1975. So, uh, again, uh, it's kind of like a very uh, beneficial uh, collaboration. So for the young people driving ambitious Africa, uh, it's great to plug into the uh, Wärtsilä network that Wärtsilä has already been on the continent since uh, longer than, you know, or before most of these uh, people were, you know, like even born. So, so I think that uh, it's great to see that kind of collaboration and, and it's very uh, beneficial for Wärtsilä because Wärtsilä gets access to these uh, amazing talent, not only here in Nordic countries, but then also in Africa, which, you know, it's not always uh, obvious for a young person, talented young person in Africa. Okay, where do I go to work? Uh, Okay, here in Finland, everybody knows Wärtsilä, but uh, not everybody in Africa knows Wärtsilä yet. So then that's a way to then connect with the ecosystem uh, there locally. So uh, yes, uh, so these kind of things we should do more. And, and I think that that's one, one thing that uh, VES could also do is uh, be uh, even more active than within uh, Ambitious Africa. So I think that there's lots of uh, opportunity to work and again on power uh, and uh, these like projects uh, across Africa. So I think it's it's a super interesting and, and super cool example of uh, kind of like this uh, ecosystem thinking in action. Yeah, ambitious Africa, definitely one of those big big bold ideas to make into reality. Uh, that is a very nice example because one of the questions that I also have and came into my mind, this is a very positive uh, example, of course, but uh, is what are the the difficulties now during the COVID situation? and uh, how they're going to develop afterwards because um, there is also there are also difficulties of not being able to travel so piloting and testing and how to start up scale up in this situation now it's um, it's also a matter of question i don't know what do you think about that yes yeah, so of course perspective of energy sector so one of the things is uh, uh, let's say digitalization is one easier part basically but of course the hardware kind of a situation 
it, it makes more difficult because innovation in general, so it's it's face to face and digital things can be perfected. But one of the things, of course, if you think younger people, it's easier for them and because they're born with, uh, let's say, digital in di the digital world. But uh, then again, energy sector is quite quite a conservative world where they're used to do the things what they in the same way as always. Uh, but the shift is coming there and. Uh, with the big bold ideas and how to get it done uh, as, as uh, Peter is mentioning. So there's opportunities there and it should be, and we sh you should use them as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and actually I think that, uh, uh, you know, and it's uh, of course a bit of a cliche at this point, but uh, I really believe that it's true that every crisis is uh, an opportunity. And uh, I mean, we've seen that uh, so many times now during the pandemic that uh, you know, there's always a way uh, to get stuff done. And I think with the Ambitious Africa, originally our thinking was that we will uh, you know, go to all the different uh, African nations and we will set up the teams you know, like on the ground meeting with the people. But of course, uh, now we couldn't do that uh, because of the pandemic and all the kind of like, uh, restrictions in travel. So we ended up doing all of these uh, launches and all of this online, which actually enabled us to launch in 25 countries in uh, less than a year. And uh, that would never have been possible kind of like without the pandemic, because uh, right now we have been able to get, uh, okay, not only the local young people, but also the local like government ministers. Like, for example, when we launched Ambitious Africa in Liberia, we had the energy minister there with us for like half an hour discussing, you know, like, uh, you know, power production in Liberia and like what the challenges are and how we could tackle them together. So uh, I think that would never have happened without the pandemic, uh, it would have been very difficult to get, you know, ministers and these kind of like high level government people to, oh, you know, like it's some online event. Uh, no, I'm not going to like attend, you know, and, and uh, now it's a commonplace. So I think that's great. And and then I have another like a uh, small like anecdote. Uh, one of my friends actually, uh, uh, he ordered like some wind uh, uh, power, wind generation for his, uh, his like, uh, uh, yeah, it's more than a summer cottage, but but anyway, uh, uh, he he actually ordered then this equipment, and I think from Turkey, and of course it got shipped and it arrived, but then of course no installation people could travel, so then had to install it. And he was telling me that they were actually sending videos, you know, back and forth between him and the factory, you know, and the engineers telling him how to install and what to do. So I think it's a great example that, yes, of course, ideally, somebody from the factory or, you know, like the, the company, uh, you know, maintaining and setting this up would have, you know, taken care of it. But now that wasn't possible. So then uh, they basically made uh, the best out of the situation and, and we're actually able to kind of like get this sorted out by just, you know, like again, using, uh, you know, pretty primitive tools if we think about it, okay, sending video back and forth. I mean, okay, no big deal. But if we all think 20 years back, uh, impossible you know you couldn't have even thought about oh I'll just like install this little like wind power plant myself uh, that's probably or you know of course some people might might do that but without any kind of like expertise now you can just connect with the factory people and uh, and you know get it done uh, but that is a, that was a very nice point yeah and it also shows how maybe more um um, conservative minds open up and that's also a very big issue on funding during this uh, pandemic that we are going through. Uh, while I don't see maybe corporates are a little bit closing their resources, but um, what are the alternative options? What do you think? How can you make a bold idea like happen? Yeah, you just go out there and do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it is true that many companies may be a bit more conservative with their money, of course, if it's a crisis and there's hard to predict situations coming up. But I do think that it's not always the case that there are still companies who are understanding that if they just stay and wait instead of investing, they will be left behind in the long run. So if they don't do it today, they might not have time to do it tomorrow. So it's it's not completely off limits to be investing now uh, in, in new operations, in my, in my experience at least. Mm -hmm. Yes, and in general, if you think about funding, so it, everything comes as Peter earlier stated that you have the big idea and you start with the smaller one and you build it from that one. So basically you can build the funding in different ways. You don't necessarily need to have all the money directly ready. ready. 
as it is, but you can start with something, some, somebody brings some resources, expertise, and you not necessarily need to have to pay for that one. And then you have also different kind of governmental grants and, and all this kind of stuff which can be used. And you don't need to have that directly all the money available once you start, just keep on doing it. So definitely that's one of the things uh, uh, Peter has been great with uh, the tunnel project, for example. So you have to start with something, building it, and a bold vision in in head. No, but I think that it's uh, it's also um, um, kind of like a, a little bit along the line of uh, you know uh, uh, every crisis being being an opportunity. I think also that uh, it's an opportunity to kind of like change uh, behavior, and I think that. Uh, uh, what happened with, the, for example, the schools, you know, that it took like a day or two and then all of a sudden everybody was online. And, uh, you know, if you would have told people then like last year or before the pandemic that, you know, uh, we're just going to move everybody, you know, online in a day. And then, you know, people would tell me that, Peter, you're crazy. It can't be done in a day. Of course, it <laughs> could be done because we had to do it. And I think that this applies to kind of like some of the conservative like uh, industries that, I mean, if you can't send your installation people somewhere, then you have to kind of like figure out that, okay, how could the customer maybe install some of this himself? What kind of tools, what can you like uh, develop uh, to make, uh, you know, uh, that happen? And and uh, I think that it's both for kind of like the people making these things, but also people then like buying these things that, hey, all of a sudden it's perfectly okay to do things differently because you have to. And I think that that is a great opportunity to change behavior because we know that it's very, very difficult to do that if you don't have to. I mean, then you'll just like uh, do what you are used to doing and you're like staying within your comfort zone. But now that's not, you know, like uh, possible. So you have to do things uh, in a new way. And, and that's, uh, I think also we shouldn't let uh, a kind of like a, a big crisis goes to waste in that way that now we have an opportunity to change the behaviors because we have to do it. And, and I think that's... Uh, you know, kind of like looking at this from uh, like uh, in a positive way. Of course, you know, uh, there's nothing positive about the pandemic like otherwise, but uh, at least uh, if we can use it to change the behavior, I think it's fantastic. So seizing the opportunity, that's definitely one of the things. Uh, what it comes about, it's about timing anyways as well, but seizing the opportunity in the right way, uh, cooperating, using the resources of the others and together. Uh, what else could you add on that one if you think about making the, the bold things reality? Do you need any more ingredients? What do you think of the others? Or is that too makes it happen basically? Of course, making the right connections and having the right people on board who really believe and would like to see that happen, but that's that's about the connections. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think putting yourself out there and kind of doing everything you can is, is the best starting point for anything. Uh, and kind of believing in yourself and being courageous when you're doing something new. So that's a good starting point. Yeah, totally agree. At this point, I would like you to thank Peter very much for his uh, collaboration and his thoughts. And uh, we would like to wish you good luck thank with you. Uh, all of your great plans and your bold ideas that uh, we are sure that you can make it, them a reality. Yeah. Dave, thanks for having me and I uh, look forward to doing more. Yeah, <laughs> looking forward to participate and having a, a lot of good discussions going on in, in the future as well and future cooperation. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Next, we will continue with the top 30 most promising startups in Europe. At this point, I would like to welcome course coordinator Oskar Znikowski and Professor Jorma Larimo of the University of Vasa. Thank you, Martina. Pleasure to have you here, Jorma and Oskar. Top 30 most promising energy startups started seven years ago. The idea was originally from VNT Management, which is one of the first clean tech investors in Europe. Uh, and uh, 
there we have some ideas that how actually to bring the ideas to the surface. So it first started with the VES. Uh, at the same time, actually, VES was founded in 2015. And uh, we had a workshop finding out the nice startups around the Europe. And we evaluated them. So the basically, from that perspective, it has been evolving since then. And now we also involve University of Vasa and VES. And this is our seventh time we'll be presenting the top most, 30 most promising energy startups in Europe. And we were also presenting some of the cases we found in, in this, to the, this year's schedule. I think now we could perhaps take Jorma, could tell more about how, how University of Vasa sees the situation and what's the current, current situation from uh, University of Vasa. Mm. OK, thanks, Marco. So uh, I can remember very well one Saturday noon when I was visiting the local Revel Center and Wes had there a promotion event from the recently established organization. And uh, I started to listen what was going on and uh, discuss with Wes people and Marco was there as well and started to be more interested what's going on and uh, after the weekend I uh, called to Marco again and uh, discussed with him what's going on really and he informed that there is a forthcoming weekend where there will be one of those first final evaluation rounds of these uh, top 30 energy startups and we agreed that uh, I shall follow the weekend and uh, the weekend was so really interesting that uh, we started to develop that. It was all, all, only something that uh, these keen uh, students uh, were doing, but without uh, receiving any credits. And uh, because it was something that the uh, university was uh, as well interested. There was growing interest inside the university towards energy business, and uh, one indication is now this course and the Webic Center that we have uh, in Palosari. So that based on that, we started to go on and we organized the course of uh, as a real uh, university course uh, in cooperation with West and uh, Energy Spin uh, in autumn 2016. And uh, it was a, a really interesting uh, experience with those 20 students we had uh, in the course. And uh, if this, that we continue to, uh, with that, so that following year, uh, well, Energy Spin had uh, started with this uh, new course for uh, startup managers. And uh, uh, we agreed with Marco that why not to integrate these startup companies as well to these course. And uh, it was a uh, really good idea so that uh, students could uh, uh, listen pitches by these startup uh, managers and make questions to them and learn from the evaluation of the companies uh, as much as well. And in this uh, 2017 round, we had as well Oskar uh, Sniegowski, who is coming from Poznan, so who participated the course. So, so I wonder if you, Oskar, you could say a few words about that. Yes, uh, first of all, I'm very glad to be here because as Professor Larimo said, I uh, made it uh, from the bottom to the top, let's say. So first I started as a student and now I became a course coordinator for this marvelous program and marvelous top 30 list that we, uh, that we do for the few years now in a row. Uh, why I got interested in this course in 2017 when I took it as a student is uh, simply because it was something unusual, something, uh, something what universities do not usually offer. We had an opportunity to not only get in touch with startups but also uh, supported by official letters and words from the university, we could contact them and get in touch with, with owners, with inventors, and this is what students are always looking for because then they might have opportunity to, to find work. 
uh, later in these companies or simply just to build their uh, network. Uh, and indeed, it was great. I made uh, many uh, great contacts back then that helped me later to excel in my in my performance, both at the university and get in this position. Uh, so yeah, this course has something that none other has, which is this direct face-to-face, -face, uh, direct face-to-face -face meeting with people and uh, getting in touch with business, getting in touch with with uh, change. Uh, as it's focusing on the energy market. This was the time when the energy market was really growing and, and gained pop popularity, and also among students. So everybody wanted to work and still want to work in companies like Tesla uh, or any other that is involved in this business. So uh, this was something that was very important to me, uh, the personal growth element in this course. And uh, I'm very happy that now I can be helping other students to achieve the same results. Yeah, th thank you, Oscar. I remember very well when uh, Jorma and also Oscar uh, participated the first time in the course, uh, or the first time it wasn't the course, but when Oscar participated, and also we had Kristina Kotkova, we actually hired her from uh, Czech, and uh, so the excellent people in the course and very much hands-on working with the startups and also the business. And we will see most, m many of the startups in, in the earlier, earlier patches we've seen in the top 30, they have managed to grow and make a lot of, lot of business as well. And uh, we believe many of the top 30 promising startups will be the similar in this year as well. And uh, now we had the, the, the last autumn, the last round. And uh, let's see, but so that our results are here and so on. But of course, COVID hit it as, as well. And uh, perhaps now, uh, uh, Oscar, you can say a few words about that uh, last round, so where we had already over 60 students in our course. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, as, as uh, Professor Larimo mentioned, because of the COVID-19, it has been quite a ride. Uh, I, cannot, uh, I cannot refuse that, but I still think that this year's edition was a great success, mainly because of uh, how much work our students put into this, uh, into this assignment and how much, uh, how much time they invested into making, it, uh, into making this list uh, the best possible. Uh, they screened uh, over 200 companies this year to find the uh, best of the best, uh, the, creme de la, the creme de la creme of European energy market scene. And, uh, well, the results you'll see today on this top 30 uh, energy spin list uh, for 2021. Mm, yeah, this list is a result of a semester-long search. Uh, yeah, uh, as you mentioned, uh, sir, the course received the award uh, for being the most uh, innovative course at the University of Vasa in 2019, and I believe it is for a reason, uh, because... Uh, we do our best to make this course a universal interdisciplinary experience, something that students can use in different areas, uh, and it's different from what the usual uh, university course looks like, uh, mainly because of this uh, interaction and face-to-face and -face aspect, uh, or uh, contacting these startups and actually doing work yourself. So not exactly working with a study book, but working in a practical sense of things. One uh, key aspect of the course from the beginning has been that the end result has been a leaflet. Uh, so where there are these uh, uh, top 30 energy business start-up firms, a summary of the firms, and these key results are summarized as well in the energy week that's uh, held uh, every year in March. And uh, now we had uh, the last evaluation round and uh, perhaps uh, uh, Marco, can, shall you tell a little bit so how the results are published? We will receive or have later in this session as well presentation of the three companies that were uh, uh, among the top 30, but uh, to, to access the whole list and so on. And, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Larima. Yes, we have been presenting the startups, the most top 30, and a lot of excellent results. Some of the earlier ones, they have gone bankrupt. Some of them are made, doing excellent results. Uh, and we're glad to present them now. You've been seen in our homepage. You will be seeing our social media from the NSSPIN. 
and uh, follow, follow, follow from that one. You can download the list and see the, what startups are there. They are in the random order, in a, uh, or not random order, but they don't be in the order of uh, which one is the best, uh, but all are somehow related to each other. So they've been evaluated how the, let's say, investors evaluate in regular basis the startups in one, when they invest in them. So that's how the evaluation is done to, by the participants in the, in the course. And that's, we believe, that will be also the future. It's about team, it's about the other, other it's about the prospects of the future, it's about the, how to pick the market is, so the many things that we take into effect. But basically, follow our homepage, see the, our Facebook page, uh, LinkedIn, and you can see the results there. And we hope the, very the best luck for the, all the startups who will be participating there. And we'll have a couple of them now represented by our, the, our students in the course in just uh, randomly picked up. So looking forward to having the couple of presentations now. Hi, my name is Thomas Höglund. I'm a Swedish-speaking Finn from Vasa, and uh, I studied automation engineering and graduated from the University of Vasa in 2014. Uh, then I worked for a couple of years, and I returned to the University of Vasa to do my uh, doctoral degree in robotics, and I'm, I'm finishing that now. I have also uh, started my own startup company called Dan Robotics. And uh, even though I filled all my credits points at the university I, I needed, I decided to take the course uh, Startup Valuation and Market Analysis because it seemed uh, really interesting and, and uh, valuable for me. And indeed, it was uh, a great course. I uh, learned, uh, got to know lots of startups, and uh, I learned how to evaluate them, and, uh, and I, I got some skills that will be necessary also uh, for me in my work with my startup company. I can, I can know how, how investors think and I can uh, uh, show my startup uh, to the investors in the right way and think about, think about things from the investor's perspective now. Okay, so let me present the startup Einride. Einride is a Swedish company founded in 2016. Uh, it was funded, uh, founded by three Swedes and now they have 103 employees. Uh, their CEO, Robert Falk, uh, used to be a director at Volvo before, so the CEO has quite relevant experience. And uh, they are manufacturing electric driverless trucks for emission-free road freight. And uh, they have, in fact, already been operating for some time on Swedish road, roads with their pilot customers. Uh, they say that uh, the pod is the first all-electric, totally autonomous transport vehicle to operate on a public road in the world. And uh, they have this uh, remote operating and uh, monitoring capability to keep track of, of their fleet and, and control it remotely. And they, they also offer a platform for uh, manual electric trucks for intelligent planning, scheduling and uh, routing capabilities. The uh, potential is quite large for Einright. They are targeting uh, uh, the majority of freight applications, uh, and they, they want to build an efficient and sustainable solution. And uh, they are piloting now in Sweden with uh, DB Schenker, Coca-Cola, and uh, Oatly. And they have uh, raised uh, 42.3 million euros, mostly from venture capital, but also some from angel investors. Uh, mainly they raised 25 million euros in 2019 and 10 million euros in 2020. And uh, they are also partnering with Ericsson and Telia on uh, 5G for teleoperation. And uh, they uh, also won a, a prize. Uh, they won two categories in the Energy Innovation Contest E Prize by uh, Aeon and Becasa uh, Färön in Sweden. And uh, they also won a couple of patent patents which look quite valuable. So I, I think they're. It looks like they're off to a very good start, and I want to wish Einride a good luck. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Titian Nguyen. I am 24 years old and from Berlin, Germany. I moved here for my studies uh, now, and uh, my bachelor I did in Berlin as well. 
I gained last year in summer my Bachelor of Arts in Business, uh, develop, uh, business Administration and my specialization was in marketing and entrepreneurship. Now I'm studying strategic business development at the University of Vasa and I enrolled in the course because I thought it would be a nice experience to get in touch with other startups also from another country than just only Germany and also to get uh, better connections in Finland since uh, that's quite important in the business area if you want to make connections, build a network in Finland. And um, I gained a really nice experience while talking to other startups, get in touch with them, have an easy conversation with them about uh, what they're doing and how they are uh, trying to develop themselves. And it helps to get also the point of view of an investor also because we have in our course uh, the startup roasting where we actually evalu uh, evaluated and uh, gave some startups were, which were competing with each other fake real money. So that was really interesting as well. And <clears throat> one of the startups that I researched was uh, DHP technology. It was established in 2015 in Grüsch and is now operating at Sitzers in Switzerland. And the founders are Jayan A. Diem and Andreas Hügli. And they are supported by an approximately team of 34 people. And a DHP is producing and developing solar, uh, solar panels, which have an automatic folding system which actually gives uh, industrial areas a double use since it's built on existing places so they don't need a new place and where they get built on those industrial areas get the benefit of consuming their own built produced energy and yes they already have some implemented projects in Switzerland five were already implemented and in cooperation with the municipalities and with the regional water waste associations for example in Danvos or Münsterlingen or at the parking place at Kronberg and now they have ongoing projects in Blitzen, Sees, Flöms and Bassersdorf. Yes, and the benefits of DHP is that they don't need an extra environment where they have to build the solar, solar panels. They can just build it on top on something which is already existing and the panels are have a lightweight construction so the folding mechanism can always be always happening automatically. A um, so-called uh, meteor algorithm is collecting data about the environment and if a bad weather such as snow, hail or a blizzard starts then they just start folding each other together again and when they are open they are reducing the agile formation at clarifiers so it has it's actually reducing the negative effects in uh, waste water uh, in clarifiers at waste water plants and uh, they also give an easier access to the pools if they need the annual treatment for the uh, when they need to clean the pools and yes, they also have already uh, get, gained some rewards, for example, like this with Polar Prize in 2019 and others as well. They are also certificated with the Bureau of Veritas uh, from the Bureau of Veritas in Switzerland and are supported by the Swiss Federal Office of Energy, Swiss Climate Foundation and European Commission. Okay. And now I'm going to ask some questions to THP technology. The first question is, uh, what is the average duration of such a project to implement the solar panels? My name is Frederick Gord and I am the project development manager at THP. What is the average duration of a project? We first offer a preliminary study which clarifies the technical feasibility, the ability to obtain a permit as well as the economic efficiency. Together with a fixed quote price, this provides the client with a reliable basis for his decision. From the moment the financing is secured and the building permit is issued, 
a solar folding roof can be constructed with less than 12 months. Are you planning to enter in the international market as well? And if so, what kind of barriers are you seeing to operate internationally? My name is Carmen Joyber and I am Acquisition and Project Manager. Are you planning to enter the international markets? What barriers do you see and are you considering partnerships? After the successful market entry in Switzerland, we are now planning to enter the European market. Currently, we are working on several preliminary studies for projects in Germany and Austria, together with partner companies. Different regulations and funding opportunities apply to energy projects abroad than in Switzerland. We must first become familiar with this. For markets outside Europe, DHB is still building distribution partnerships or offering technology sales. We have already signed three letters of intent for partnerships in international market areas. What is the error rate of the Metro algorithm? My name is Dario Nikli and I'm a commissioning engineer at DHP. What is the error rate of the Meteor algorithm? So far, no error has occurred in a running project. We have now four years of experience and could optimize the weather-based control mechanism even further. We aim to add energy management and optimization tools for our customers. This will enable them to further increase self-consumption and self-sufficiency. What happens if the roof doesn't close? Is there a manual handling to fold the solar panels? Yeah. Which market has the best potential for you? My name is John Andre Diem. I'm co-founder and managing director of DHP Technology. I answer to the question, what is our main target market and customer? DHP wants to become the world's sole provider for the dual usage of sewage treatment plants for solar power production and self-consumption. Furthermore, we want to become a dominant provider for the dual use of parking and logistic areas for the solar power production in combination with electric mobility and hydrogen mobility. As a result, our customers are the public sector, energy supply companies and private owners of industrial sites. Where do you see yourself in five years? Hi, my name is Andreas Sugli and I'm co-founder and managing director of DHP Technology. Where do we see ourselves within five years from now? In the next five years, we want to grow farther in Switzerland and in selected markets in Europe and overseas. Our aim is to become the market standard application for solar power generation over infrastructures like sewage plants and to become the preferred solution provider for decentralized power generation for e-mobility and hydrogen mobility. We will establish partnerships and expand into new markets and provide new services and products. Hi, my name is Johanna Pankmin and I'm 24 years old and from Hamburg, Germany. I am a supply chain specialist and I have worked with companies like Bayersdorf AG or Tesa SE from Hamburg in my past. Now I am a fifth semester bachelor student of business administration and economics at the University of Southern Denmark in beautiful Sonneborg. I also work at the Danish actuator producer Lina KS in operations department. Last autumn, I had the amazing opportunity, despite of the current pandemic, to take an exchange semester from my bachelor program in business administration and economics at the University of Warsaw. There I had the opportunity to take the course data valuation because I wanted to take a course that is not just general business administration, but a little bit more specific. And I was very lucky there because I'm very interested in renewable resources and technologies. And I had a great opportunity to have some insights in that field and to get to know very many interesting companies. So today I have the honor to present to you the startup Beyonder IS. Beyonder is a Norwegian startup from Sanders, Rogaland, Norway, that is pretty close to Stavanger. And it was founded in 2006. Their aim is to 
manufacture renewable batteries. So batteries that have a lower environmental impact than the usual ones we know. Um, the startup was founded in 2016 by Sven Kvernstun, who is a very, very experienced business person and who had um, several experiences in leading people, leading businesses, and also in the market segment. He's currently leading a team of 28 people and they're trying to even hire more people. Now let's have a look at the technology behind the product. The aim of the technology is to decrease the negative environmental impact of battery use. As we all know, batteries usually require some rare earths, which have severe problems in the extraction process where often workers' rights are violated and it's also not good for the environment. Also, there's still a problem that too few batteries are recycled and um, it takes a lot of energy and water consumption to produce batteries. Beyond a solution is to produce batteries from ecological materials, materials like sawdust. Other um, advantages of the products are non-inflammability and the capability to be fully charged in two minutes and up to 100,000 times. So can, you can use this battery for quite a while. So we can overall also say that the safety is also improved compared to competitive products and not only the environmental footprint. The spectrum of use for Beyond our batteries is wide. They can be used in uninterruptible power supply, but also in applications with high startup currents like buses or construction machinery. So now I would like to talk to you about the products of Beyond them. The very first product that Beyond is planning on producing is world's first true sustainable battery cell technology made from active carbon obtained from sustainable forestry residue. This technology has applications in both industrial and utility needs, such as an energy storage and battery technology. The second product that Beyond IS wants to produce is the supercapacitor for energy storage, which is frequently experiencing charge and discharge cycles. This product stands out with very fast charging and discharging capacity. The third product is the lithium ion capacitor. This is a combination of the capacitive cathode of the supercapacitor and the battery type A node of the lithium ion battery. This means faster charge and higher power. It's durable and it even works in low temperature. All these product types are eco-friendly, high performance and have renewable energy sources. So how does the future look like for Beyond AS? We obviously believe that it's going to be bright, otherwise the startup wouldn't have been mentioned in the top 30 list. Beyonder holds patents for all their technology, so they are protected from competitive forces in that sense. Beyonder also started a very deep partnership with the German machine producer Siemens, where they especially focus on virtual simulations capacity and the production and development of the battery cells as they are still in a development phase. So there has not been a production of the product yet and Siemens is trying to help with that. Um, further partners are, and investors, there are a lot. Um, there is, for instance, DSD Investering, Equino Ventures, Innovation Norway, United Green Technology, and also the University of Stavanger in these are either partners or even investors. So as you can see, the startup has a very bright network here. Um, Beyonder was also nominated for the Ziva Prize in 2020. They didn't win. However, the nomination can be mentioned here. Uh, the team, as I mentioned previously, consists of 28 people. There are currently five open positions. So the company is hiring more personnel. So the goal for Beyonda is to set up an own battery plant by 2023 in Norway to start the production of the green energy cells and batteries there. Um, their goal is to start conquering the Norwegian market 
and then move on to other markets from there. We saw very huge potential in this technology as it's a painkiller in the field of battery technology and for sustainable energy development. And we think that this company can be very successful in the future. And if you have any further questions or if you want to have more information, you can always visit their website. Does Beyond AS work on further technologies rather than the three product types? which are currently in development. Uh, my name is Sveti Kraftstud. I'm the CEO and founder of Beyonder. Of course, we are a high-tech company and uh, new products and uh, continuous development is the life insurance of a company. So uh, we are definitely working already on uh, some uh, new and exciting solutions to come. How is the battery performance in KPIs like half-life period and discharge rate compared to competitive products? That's uh, one of the other um, advantages of our technologies. We have a uh, life cycle of more than 100,000 uh, cycles, um, which is significantly more than uh, what is available uh, on the market today. Where do you want to be with Beyonder in 10 years in regard to profitability and market position? Uh, Beyonder is uh, starting uh, locally here, but we are uh, planning to be uh, global. We see the, the entire globe as our natural market and uh, will in 10 years definitely uh, have uh, production capacity uh, both in Norway, but also in other geo market to serve that uh, market. And the plan is to take a leading role in the high power uh, energy storage 